Welcome to session 46 in the World of Speculative Fiction series. This time we are going to be focused on Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea Trilogy, which of course was expanded into further volumes, but we're going to be focusing just on the first three volumes. So this is a talk series that I started back in 2016. Originally we met in face-to-face -face sessions at the Brookfield Public Library. We had a lot of lively discussions. We would pick uh, authors and texts that, that had a, a sort of common narrative world. So we did things like looking at Tolkien's Lord of the Rings or Roger Zelazny's uh, Chronicles of Amber, things along those sort of lines. And we did Ursula K. Le Guin in the very first year, concentrating on her Heinish novels, these science fiction novels set out there in the galaxy. This time we're going to be revisiting Ursula K. Le Guin and, as I said, focusing on the Earthsea trilogy. So they're all contained here in this massive tone, the books of Earthsea, and we include two early short stories in there as well that we'll talk about in just a moment. So what we're doing this month is sort of part of a double header. Um, we're going to go into the, the first three uh, novels in the Earthsea trilogy, and we're going to reserve the other three main books of Earthsea for next month. So, you know, we're not going to have to cover this entire thing in one fell swoop, and that will allow a little bit of a deeper study and discussion about what was going on in this. Now, Every one of these talks has been involving several different elements. We talk about the biography of the author. We also focus a lot on the, the world building, the narrative universe that is constructed by the author and what its features are and what's going on in it. Inevitably, that means that we get into character and plot and theme and, and other elements, but the world building is really quite central. That's why it's worlds of spec speculative fiction. And then after that, we would generally talk about a number of different philosophical themes that are being raised or discussed or in some way addressed by the uh, novels or short stories that, that we're looking at. So in the case of Ursula K. Le Guin, for example, one of these would be the nature of human identity, so important both in A Wizard of Earthsea, but also in the, the two follow-up novels as well. Another key philosophical theme would be that of the equilibrium, which is coming to some degree out of Le Guin's own study of Taoism, and it's woven into the story. So we're going to talk about all of those sorts of themes after we get into her biography and the world building. Before that, I do want to say a little bit about why I selected these particular works. Um, I just recently turned 50, and one of the things that I, I asked for in my wish list, which somebody did in fact purchase for me, very nice uh, for them to do that, was this, this omnibus, uh, the, world, the Books of Earthsea, the illustrated edition, which has not only all of the stories, and novels, and also some, some great little retrospectives by Ursula K. Le Guin herself, but also some amazing illustrations. I mean, you can see the cover art is, is quite excellent as, as well. And I encountered the Earthsea novels as a middle schooler. Um, I read Ursula K. Le Guin's The Beginning Place, and then I, I was at the Waukesha Library. I used to browse around in, they had these big, uh, you know, turning things. I forget exactly what they're called, but I, you've, you've all seen them in drugstores or bookstores, and they'd have all these books on them. And there was a, a, a section for, I think, like, you know, teenage uh, fantasy and science fiction novels. And so I was over there and I saw these, these books and I was, you know, very interested in, in dragons and wizards and things like that at that time. So I grabbed the, the first one and started reading it and it was, it was really quite captivating. And then, you know, I read the, the ones that followed after that. And at that time, that was basically uh, as much as you could get. And then I remember getting a copy of The Wind's Twelve Quarters when I was a college student. And then, you know, I read a lot of other Ursula K. Le Guin things as well. 
But so those were the definitive ones for me, those first three novels, you know, A Wizard of Earthsea, Tombs of Atuan, and The Farthest Shore. And this character of, of Ged, I, I found it extraordinarily compelling. I think at that time, I didn't really quite care as much about the other characters, quite frankly, but I really identified with, with him and what he was what he was going through. So, you know, the other thing I'll say, too, before we jump into talking about Ursula K. Le Guin and, and her life and biography is that um, if you haven't read these these stories, you are going to find that because of her writing style and because of the brevity of these novels that they're they're fairly easy to work your way through you could probably read your way through any one of the first three novels over the course of a long day and these would be ideal stories to to read while you're you know stuck doing something like in quarantine or convalescing or on, you know, for me, it would be like on a, a gloomy uh, kind of cold day with the windows open uh, and, you know, smell of rain in the air. If you have a fireplace, a, a fire lit in it, enjoying some sort of, you know, drink like uh, could be in my case coffee or if you like beer or a glass of wine or hot cocoa or something like that and just curling up and reading your way through these novels. I think that would be almost an ideal way to do it. If you could have a cat in your lap at the time, that might make it even better. Um, but they're, they're all really wonderful novels. They've, they have definitely stood the test of time. I haven't read The Wizard of Earthsea and Tombs of Adewan, uh until... I hadn't read them since I was a kid until, until I uh, started preparing for it for this. So they are just as good now as they were back then. And so let's jump now into talking about Ursula K. Le Guin, this amazing author and the very interesting life that she lived. Ursula K. Le Guin is an author who was very productive, lived a very long and rich life. She only died quite recently. She was born in 1929 to... Uh, her father, Albert Kraber, and Theodora Krakow. And so Kraber was her original name. She was born in, in Berkeley, California. And I'll go into a bit of why that family background matters, but I do want to point out that in 1938, as a nine-year-old, she writes her first fantasy story. So like many of the other people that we've talked about in this series, she is getting an early start and she's she's doing what many of them did, which is reading extensively and then taking what she's she's reading and sort of modeling herself after that. Uh, in 1940, uh, she submits a science fiction story to Astounding, is rejected. So she's already learning uh, the, the, the fact that it's quite difficult to get yourself in, uh, at least a foot in the door. And um, she's going to go off, you know, she finishes high school, goes off uh, to college, goes to Radcliffe and graduates with a bachelor's and begins writing novels. Um, in 1952, she is at Columbia University. She receives her master's there. And in 1953, something rather important is going to happen. Uh, she goes. She wins a Fulbright scholarship. Goes to study in France. And a Fulbright scholarship, if you're if you're not aware of what these are, they are you know uh, scholarships, money set aside to help Americans go to other places. They also bring people here. And the idea is to you know develop a cadre of people who have intercultural understanding. So this is a good time to back up a little bit and talk about. Um, you know, the, the life that she lived in Berkeley. So one of the things she said in, in one of the many interviews, uh, she said there was something in the air that her, bra her father breathed as an anthropologist. The people he knew, the people who came to the house and the things they talked about. You could say I grew up, now this is a wonderful expression, in a house where all the doors were open. There weren't just, there weren't, just weren't a lot of shut doors and no locked ones. And that does something to a kid's mind. 
It gives them freedom and a kind of security in the world. Okay, people are different. There's all kinds of different people. Isn't that interesting? Instead of another reaction possible, oh, isn't that horrible? So, you know, she's growing up in a household in which some of the things that we nowadays stress, I would say, at least in part of our educational world, about tolerance and understanding and appreciation of difference and diversity, those were, you could say, the norm. It doesn't mean that anything anybody did was automatically good, but it meant that you would judge people based on how they were, and you would try to understand what was going on in their mind. And so for, for a novelist, especially the kind that she's going to become, this is indeed quite, quite helpful. Um, she did go to, to Berkeley High. She said that there were 3,500 kids there. And it's, it's kind of an interesting curiosity. She and Philip K. Dick were there at the same time. And she says, nobody knew Philip K. Dick. I have not found one person from Berkeley High who knew him. He was an invisible classmate. So, you know, it's easy to, to understand. They, they didn't run into each other. Now, coming back to, to being in France, she meets and marries Charles A. Le Guin there. And they, they eventually settle in Portland, Oregon. So still on the West Coast. And in 1961, she starts publishing short stories in various magazines. So after a number of rejections, she finally gets some, some traction. And two of the short stories that are, are found in this volume, in part because they are, you could say, the nucleus of the, the whole Earthsea universe, or if not the nucleus, at least a seed from which they come out, um, two of those short stories are published in 1964, The Rule of Names and The Word of Unbinding. Both of them are dealing with, with magic and the sort of system that's going to be found in Earthsea that she's going to develop. And um, then she starts having a lot more success. In 1966, she publishes Rokinen's World and Planet of Exile. You heard me mention the Hainish novels a little bit earlier. Those are two of the, the first ones. 67, City of Illusions, something that's in the middle of the Hainish cycle, as we now call it. And then in 1968, she publishes A Wizard of Earthsea and Nine Lives. And here, I think it's good to go to what Le Guin herself had to say in the afterword to A Wizard of Earthsea. And I'm going to read some of this to you. She said, Once upon a time, a publisher asked me if I'd write a novel for teenagers. Oh, no, I said. No, no, thanks very much, but I couldn't. It was the idea of writing with a specific audience in mind uh, or a specific age of reader that scared me off. I'd published fantasy and science fiction, but I was interested in the form itself, not in who read it or how old they were. But maybe my real novel was I'd spent so many years writing novels, sending them to publishers and having them come back with a dull thud on the door, doormat that I had tr trouble comprehending an actual publisher had actually asked me to write a book. This is sort of a surprise for her. And so, you know, skipping forward a little bit, she said, I thought about it. The idea sank in. Would writing for older kids be so different than just writing? Why? Despite what some adults seem to think, teenagers are fully human, and some of them read as intensely and keenly as if their life depended on it. Sometimes maybe it does. And here we could actually have a little digression about, you know, the YA or young adult genre, which is a huge, huge uh, market at this point in time, but didn't it did exist back then, but not to the degree that it does now. Le Guin is, in fact, you could say, rejecting that, that notion of a genre split. So she goes on and she says, fantasy, pure old fashioned fantasy, not mixed with science fiction. I like the idea. All my life I'd been reading about wizards, dragons, magic spells. And she says, back in 1967, wizards were all more or less two, Merlin, Gandalf, right? The Merlin of the King Arthur stories, Gandalf of the incredibly, by that time, successful Lord of the Rings. And she says, old men, peaked hats, white beards. But this was to be a book for young people. Well, Merlin and Gandalf must have been young once, right? And when they were young, when they were fool kids, how did they learn to be wizards? So she asked herself that question, and there was the impetus and the core for her book. 
And if you think about Gad, if you've read The Wizard of Earthsea, he is kind of a screw-up at first, the way that most of us are as kids. In, in his case, he creates uh, a rift within you know, uh, the, the world by, by his foolishness, but you know, we all create some rifts of one form or another. She goes on, and, and then she talks about, before I, I began to write the story, I got a big piece of poster board and drew the map. I drew all the islands of Earthsea, the archipelago, the Cargad lands, the reaches, and I named them. Havnor, the great island at the middle of the world, Celador, far out in the west, and the Dragon's Run, and her at her and all the rest. But only as I sailed with Ged from Gaunt did I get to know the islands one by one. With them I first came to Roke and the Ninety Isles and Oskill and further east even than Astawell. And with him I first went to the dark dry country, the place across the wall where the dead must go. So she's telling us about her world building process there, which we're going to get into shortly. And then she says, um, here we go. When A Wizard of Earthsea came out, there had not been a book like it. It was original. It was something new. But it was also conventional enough not to frighten reviewers. It was very well received. It won a uh, Boston Globe Horn Book Award. And the fact that fantasy isn't for a certain age, but is a literature accessible to anyone who reads, that helped too. And she goes on and she talks about the conventionality of the story, its originality, reflect its existence, and partial subversion of an accepted, recognized tradition I, I grew up with. That is the tradition of fantastic tales and hero stories, right? And she says that mo most of this flood of literature was written for adults, but modernist literary ideology shunted it to children. And kids could and did swim in it happily as in their native element, at least until some teacher or professor told them they had to come out, dry off, and breathe modernism ever after. And so she, she's talking here about, you know, this uh, great development of Earthsea as a place where she can work out the, these, these stories. And so The Wizard of Earthsea is coming out, like we said, in 68. 69, The Left Hand of Darkness, major uh, achievement for her. It wins the Hugo and, and Nebula Awards the, the next year. And then um, the, the Earthsea stuff continues. 1971, she brings out both The Tombs of Adawan and The Lathe of Heaven. That's a wonderful book, too. If you haven't read it, you should. And then 1972, she writes The Farthest Shore. And that's, that's essentially the Earthsea trilogy. Wizard of Earthsea, Tombs of Adawan, The Farthest Shore, all happening within you know, uh, roughly a five-year period. Um, and so there's, there's a, a good continuity there. She's also writing some other Earthsea stories at the time. She writes an essay from Elfland to Poughkeepsie, which is a really wonderful discussion of the fantasy genre uh, in uh, 1973. Uh, 1974 writes The Dispossessed, which wins the Nebula, and then shortly afterwards a Hugo. In 75, she also writes The Wind's Twelve Quarters, a series of short stories, some of which are Earthsea stories. Um, in uh, 1976, she follows this up with The Word for World is Forest, another one of the Hainish novels, Orsinian Tales. And, you know, it continues on uh, past that. 78, Eye of the Heron. Uh, 1979, uh, Malafrena. 1980, The Beginning Place, the one I'd mentioned reading before. 1982, The Compass Rose. So it's book after book after book after book. She's quite fruitful. And she gives a commencement address at Mills College, which is, which is quite interesting. It's called the Left-Handed Commencement Address. In 1984, she helps to found the Oregon Institute of Literary Art. So one of the things that's important about Le Guin is she's not a, she's not an artist. She's not a writer who withdraws to her, you know, little castle away from everybody and then does her craft and then, you know, doesn't engage. She actually was, was you know, considerably engaged with the literary and artistic community uh, throughout her entire life. Um, by the, the 90s, we're starting to see adaptations of The Wizard of Earthsea. In 1996, the BBC brings out a two-hour Wizard of Earthsea uh, in a radio form. And then she returns to Earthsea in, in 1990 with Tahanu, a novel which is going to focus on the female heroine of the tombs of Adawan. Um, in 1998... 
Le Guin had long had a very strong interest in Taoism as a philosophy and as a way of life. In 1998, or, yeah, it was 1998, she publishes a translation of the Tao Te Ching. Um, on the way, she's publishing a few more things in the Heinish Cycle, Four Ways to Forgiveness, a set of short, short stories, the telling. And then in 2001, she publishes Tales from, Earth, from Earthsea. Um, and then in uh, 2002, The Birthday of the World. In 2004, the Sci-Fi Channel uh, does an adaptation of uh, the, basically the first two books. They call it The Legend of Earthsea. It's later just called Earthsea. Le Guin, when interviewed about it, was a little bit diplomatic, saying, I'm not super happy with how this has turned out. But, you know, you, you, you know, she actually at one point said it is it'd be as if you wrote the Lord of the Rings and everything turned out great in the end, you know? <laughs> which is not how, how things ought to be. Um, in 2005, the BBC once again returned to the Earthsea and they released a six part dramatization covering the entire trilogy of it. Um, some may remember that in 2009, she was one of the people who resigned from the author's guild over the digitization that Google had just begun of books. She saw the writing on the wall of what Google might turn into and how this could be bad for authors. Um, in 2014, she was awarded a medal for distinguished contribution to American letters. And I should mention that the Library of Congress named her a living legend in 2000 uh, as well. Um, in, in 2018, she'll, she'll die 80 years, uh, 88 years old uh, at her home. She'd been in poor health for a while. Um, and so up until the end, though, she was quite active in the internet. Uh, she had a author's blog and she would write quite a few things on there and answer people's questions. She was holding writing workshops. There are a number of videos out there of her speaking. So you can really get a good flavor for her mind and, and what, what she was uh, doing. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about as, as a key philosophical theme is feminism. And Le Guin always had sort of a you know, you could call it a, a somewhat conflicted uh, relationship with feminism. She, she didn't go in whole hog. Um, she, she said, at a certain point came literary feminism, which was both a tremendous problem and a gift to me. I had to handle it, and I wasn't sure I could because I'm not much good on theory. Go away, just let me write. But the fact is I was getting stuck in my writing. I couldn't keep pretending I was a man, and so feminism came along at the right moment for me. It said to me, hey, guess what? You're a woman. You can write like a woman. I saw that women don't have to write about what men write about or write what men think they want to read. I saw that women have whole areas of experience men don't have and that they're worth writing and reading about. So then I went back and really read Virginia Woolf, a great author if you haven't read her, uh, somebody you want to dig into, and read all the books the feminists were auth offering to us, books other women had been writing for centuries. I saw that women can write like women and that they can write about different things than men. Why not? Duh. It took me years, really, to climb on board. There was some criticism of uh, the tombs of Atuan uh, about whether, it, you know, they had a female protagonist, but is it really a, a feminist work or not? This character, Arya or Tenar, is in some ways, she saves and is also saved by Ged or Sparrowhawk. Um, and then later on, uh, you know, in, in the, the next volume in the series, the, the fourth one, um, uh, she's te, uh, te, Tehanu, she's, she's retaking up this theme. So, this gives you a sense about the, the life that, that Le Guin lived. You know, it spans, uh, you know, World War II, uh, the Cold War, all these developments that were taking place in the 1960s. Another key thing that we can actually say about her uh, in, in terms of literary uh, matters is that she is actually part of the, um, what we call the new wave of, of science fiction, which was oriented away from what was called hard science fiction, you know, just lasers and, and uh, you know, 
basically the the plot and a lot of space opera and much more oriented towards looking at things through sociological or psychological or even ecological in the case of dune sorts of lenses Le Guin would also fit in there as well exploring characters and their development looking at their relationships bringing in a lot of literary devices and elements from outside of the science fiction sphere and so you know is that is that going to be present uh, in the the Earthsea trilogies uh, trilogy? I would say, not as much, but they are very without seeming so. They are very literary works. They're really well crafted. So that's probably enough about her life. Let's talk now about the world building that went into Earthsea, and I'm going to read a passage. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read this passage again. Um, she says, only as I sailed with Ged from Gaunt did I begin to know the islands one by one. So rather than being like Tolkien, where there's a creation of a map and also creation of languages and backstory and all this sort of stuff, Tolkien is what we call an architect in, in this sort of world building stuff. Um, Le Guin is more like what, what R, George R. R. Martin described himself as being a gardener where, you know, you plant some things and then you see what sprouts from it and you try to see if you can make it work together. Except in this case, of course, we're not talking about a garden so much. We're talking about an ocean that is filled with islands, at least until we get out to the furthest uh, reaches, right? And it's centered around a really big island and then there's all these other islands out there. And each has its own towns and its own approaches to things, its specializations, you could say its own its own history. There is to some degree a shared history, but the further out you get, the less the people on those other places really care about that that shared history. And there are specializations. So, you know, there there Roke, for example, is the island of the mages where all of this teaching of magic is going to be happening in a systematic way. And so it's it's a uh, it's an island land. Um, we're never quite sure what lies at the edges of the map. There are places where the ocean kind of runs out. There's the farthest shore as well, where you can reach the land of the dead and cross over. Um, and then there's the Kargish lands, which play such an important role, both in the very beginning of A Wizard of Earthsea, because that's, you know, it's Kargish raiders who are invading, and also in the uh, tombs of Atawan, which are, are set in the Kargish lands. And Le Guin, in, in her uh, uh, afterward to Wizard of Earthsea, says uh, some, some things about Earthsea that I think are quite useful to keep in mind. So she, she mentioned subversive elements to her story, right? So the subversive elements included these, having a brown-skinned hero. She said, Ged's people, the Archipelagans, are various shades of copper and brown shading into black in the south and east reaches. The light-skinned people among them have far northern or Kargish ancestors. The Kargish raiders in the first chapters are white. Seret, who both as girl and woman betrays Ged, is white. Ged is copper brown and his friend Vetch is black. I was bucking the racist tradition of fantasy, making a statement, but I made it quietly and it went almost unnoticed. She points out as well that she had a very difficult time getting illustrators to make Ged not Lily White. And this is, this is an issue too with some of the adaptations. Now, another thing she says about Earthsea, and then this has to do with her world building. She said, my story took off in its own direction, away from the tradition, also in the whole matter, of what makes heroes and villains. Hero tales and adventure fantasies traditionally put the righteous hero in a war against unrighteous enemies, which he usually wins. This convention was and still is so dominant, it's usually taken for granted. Of course, a heroic fantasy is good guys fighting bad guys, a war of good against evil. We might think about Tolkien's uh, books as, as an example. 
But there are no wars in earth sea, no soldiers, no armies, no battles, none of the militarism that came from the Arthurian saga and other sources and that by now under the influence of fantasy war games has become almost obligatory. I didn't and don't think this way. My mind doesn't work in terms of war. My imagination refuses to limit all the elements that make an adventure story and make it exciting. Danger, risk, challenge, courage to battlefields. A hero whose heroism consists of killing people is uninteresting to me, and I detest the hormonal war orgies of our visual media, the mechanical slaughter of endless battalions of black-clad, yellow-toothed, red-eyed demons. And so Earthsea becomes a place, by deliberate design, that is not just, you know, people fighting against each other and having these stories about the wars that they're doing. As a matter of fact, it's more of a place where people are challenged by the everyday, by the commercial, by in intellect and, and learning and knowledge and things like that. There are indeed conflicts. There is indeed fighting. And there are dragons coming in to sometimes cause a lot of trouble and kill people as well. There are fights. There are people drawing knives. There is bloodletting. There's even Kargish raiders, of course, coming in and, and, and raiding. But there isn't really this this whole, you know, everybody at war with everybody else, sort of a Hobbesian environment. And so that, that choice early on about what kind of what kind of plot am I going to be working with, what kind of characters, that helps to determine the world that Earthsea is. And as Le Guin points out, as we follow the characters moving from place to place to place, we find out what these these lands are like, and we find out what other peoples are like as well. A prime example of this would be the raft people in the farthest shore who come to shore every once in a while, but actually live on their own gigantic uh, you know, floating rafts uh, cut from, from trees. They have their own culture in which the whales, the great ones, are the ones who they are following. In fact, they, they think of Ged at that time, the Ark, Archmage as being perhaps one of those uh, in human form. I mentioned dragons. Um, this is a, a realm in which dragons exist, and the dragons are, you know, in, to some degree, as Le Guin said, modeled after previous versions of dragons, but they also have a sort of, we could say, a unique relationship with the mages. They, they speak an old tongue and can recognize each other. They can be incredibly dangerous. You're not supposed to look into their eyes, but they can form long-term relationships with the humans that, that actually have magical ability. And it, as it turns out, the dragons are just about as old as Earthsea. They are a race of their own. The humans in Earthsea are living in a pre-industrial society, but you could say they are quite industrious, as we find out. What identifies a person, in large part, is what kind of work they're doing, what kind of productive work, what kind of healing work, what kind of entertainment, what, what they, they value and what they bring forward into the world. And there's many different types of people to run across in this. There are a number of different ways in which rulership works out. Each island is kind of its own thing. You know, we find that in, in the farthest shore, for example, um, Arnon is a prince of Enlad, and that comes with certain uh, obligations and ideas. Um, in the, the uh, tombs of Atuan, Arha or Tenar is, is a priestess, and we learn about the religion that they're in. We can also say this, the islands of Earthsea were raised out of the sea, out of the, out of the earth at a certain point in time, uh, and then human beings began inhabiting them along with dragons and other, all the other creatures of the world. And it's you know, set in the, a far back time. There are other powers, however, who inhabit the world who are neither human nor dragon nor uh, you know, animal. And some of these old powers can be 
quite dangerous. In fact, if you, if you want to get a great idea about them, reading the tombs of Atuan would be the place to go because there's a, a great discussion of this in there where um, Ged is telling, um, telling Tenar about what's, what, what she's actually been worshipping as these old gods, what she's been uh, ministering to. They, they are not human in origin. And in some respect, they're, they're not even, you know, they're, they're, you could say they're not anti-life. They're definitely not pro-life in, in that as well. There's a stone that is, is similarly uh, an example of a old power as well. Um, the stone of uh, Terranon, which could enslave Ged at a certain point. So this is all part of the world that we're talking about. I mentioned magic, and that, that's a very important aspect of this world. They use magic, uh, everybody from you know, actual mages down to like you know, village witches and sorcerers. Um, they use a variety of different techniques to shape things, to do things. Some of it is about creating illusions. Some of it is about healing people. Some of it is about binding things together. Some of it is, is great spells that tear apart the fabric of reality. Uh, Ged himself, Sparrowhawk, does that at one point, as does the antagonist of the farthest shore, Cobb who wants to live forever. We'll talk about that theme shortly as well. But magic is an incredibly important part. So, for example, the dyers of, of wool on one of the islands that they go to in the farthest shore, because the magic of the world has been draining out through Cobb's actions, um, they're no longer able to practice their craft, and this affects the entire island and how people feel and how they they interact with each other. It also creates economic dislocations as well. So what we've got is this incredible panorama, which is never all spelled out at once. Although what's kind of cool is in this Earthsea volume, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin gives a description of Earthsea with peoples and languages, talking about the heart, the Hardic lands, the Kargid lands, talking about dragons as well, languages, writing, um, the history of the archipelago. So you can find all of those things in there. I don't need to really go into all of that. Uh, a lot of discussions about the wizardry. I will, however, before we go into the, the themes, I will, however, talk about the dragons very shortly from this. So she tells us, Stor songs and stories indicate that dragons existed before any other, any other living creature. The old hardic kennings or euphemisms for the word dragon are firstborn eldest elder children. The words for the firstborn child of a family in uh, one of the languages, Ahad and Kargish Gada, are derived from Hoth dragon in the old speech, which the dragons, by the way, speak. So she goes on and she says, the creation of Ea contains no clear references to original unity and eventually separation of dragons and humans. But this may be because the poem in its presumed original form and the language of the making dated back to a time before the separation. So the dragons are in some way related to us. And she says, dragons are born knowing the true speech, or as Ged puts it, the dragon and the speech of the dragon are one. If human beings originally shared that innate knowledge or identity, they lost it as they lost dragon nature. So the dragons, these incredibly powerful creatures, are also very old, although new ones can be born, they, they reproduce, and they come, into the, they come into the world already filled with some degree of knowledge and a capacity for language, the language that was used to first understand the world. So that's probably enough about this fantastic world building. Let's get now into some philosophical themes that help flesh the world out. And doing that, we'll also talk about characters and plots and all of that sort of stuff as well. And remember, we're restricting ourselves to the first three books of the Earthsea trilogy, along with those two early short stories as well. One of the first philosophical themes that we should look at that runs throughout the entire Earthsea 
trilogy and on into the other Earthsea stories and novels. And when she actually starts out in the, the two stories prior to the trilogy um, is what we can call after one of those stories, the rule of names. And here we get a, a good description of that. Mr. Underhill in the story, The Rule of Names, seems to be, you know, a decent enough wizard. And he's uh, by the schoolhouse where they are learning the rules of names. And so he stops to, to listen. And um, the, the school teacher is actually asking the, the children questions. It's going through a sort of catechism. And this is a, a way in which Le Guin can reveal to us what's, what's going on with names. So she says, now you know the rules of names already, children. There's two, and they're the same on every island in the world. What is one of them? It ain't polite to ask anyone what his name is, shouted a fat, quick boy, interrupted by a little girl shrieking. You can't never tell your own name to nobody, my ma says. She says, yes, Suba. Yes, Poppy, dear. Don't screech. That's right. You never ask anybody his name. You never tell your own. And then so she says, now think about our wizard. Why do we call him Mr. Underhill? And they say, because he lives under a hill. And we can think about uh, Ged a little bit later as Sparrowhawk. People can go by whatever moniker they want to or whatever fits them. And th then she asks, is that his true name? And the boy says, no. How do you know that it's not? Because he came here all alone, and so there wasn't anyone knew his true name, so they couldn't tell us, and he couldn't. And then she says, very good, Suba. Poppy, don't shout. That's right. Even a wizard can't tell his true name. When you children are through school and go through the passage, you'll leave your child names behind and keep only your true names, which you must never ask for and never give away. And now here we get to, we've, we have the two rules, you know, never ask, never give. Why? Why is that the case? The children were silent. The sheep bleated gently. Mr. Underhill answered the question. Because the name is the thing, he said in his shy, soft, husky voice. And the true name is the true thing. To speak the name is to control the thing. And so this is a, a, a really central idea. Everybody is given a name and the name is in the true speech a language that is, in a certain respect, closer to the origins of things, truer than the language that everybody else is using. Um, and so if you know the true name of a thing, if you actually have power, you can use that power and thereby bind that thing and make it do what it is that you want or destroy it or control it in some way. And so Gad, early on in A Wizard of Earthsea, she, he uh, finds out the names or at least how to summon various uh, creatures of the sky. Here we go. So He has a sister of his dead mother. She had done what was needful for him as a baby, but she had business of her own. And once he could look after himself, she paid no more heed to him. But one day, when the boy was seven years old, untaught, knowing nothing of the arts and powers that are in the world, he heard his aunt crying out words to a goat, which had jumped onto the thatch of a hut and would not come down. But it came jumping when she cried a certain rhyme to it. Next herding day, next day herding the long-haired goats, Dunny, that's his name at the time, shouted to them the words he'd heard, not knowing their use or meaning or what kinds of words they were. He yelled the rhyme aloud and the goats came to him. They came quickly, all of them together, not making any sound. They looked at him out of the dark slot in their yellow eyes. He laughed and shouted it again, the, the rhyme that gave him power over the goats. They came closer, crowding and pushing around him. All at once he felt afraid of their thick ridged horns and their strange eyes and strange silence. He tried to get away. And his aunt realizes very quickly what's going on. He has power, but he also was able to learn and use the name. And she brings him in and, she, you know, she says, As her sister's son, he'd been nothing to her, but now she looked at him with a new eye. She praised him, told him he, she might teach him rhymes he would like better, such as the word that makes a snail look out of its shell or the name that calls a falcon down from the sky. And he says, aye, teach me that name, being clear over the fright the goats had given him. The witch said to him, you will not tell that word to the other children if I teach it to you, I promise. And so she does teach it, and he learns slowly the names of all of these different things and, and brings them down to spend time with him. So the name gives you 
a kind of power, but it's a power of knowledge. It's a power of, to a certain degree, intimacy. Something else that we should talk about with respect to names is not just the importance of power, but how the sharing of a name, the revelation of a name to another person is a becoming vulnerable to them, a matter of trust. And so, you know, you can learn names by people actually thinking you're a decent person and trusting you and giving you the name, or there's many other ways of finding the names of things as well, particularly for one who has power. You could find them written down somewhere. If it's something that's been around for a long time, you can use dark arts to discover the names of things. You can spend time with them and perhaps the names will come clear as well. And so what we find is that Ged, which is the true name of, of the the wizard uh, of Earthsea, right? The, the guy who starts out and, you know, is Sparrowhawk and, and all those, Dunny and all those things. Um, he will reveal his true name to a few people with whom he is friends. We should point out another thing as well about true names. Dragons, who play some role in the Earthsea universe and play uh, per a particularly important role, I would say, in the third one, uh, the farthest shore. Dragons speak to people and address them by their true names. There is no hiding any of that from the dragons. They speak the true speech and they are linguistic beings. They're born already having that language. Human beings are different. Human beings speak a language that reveals and conceals at the same time. And so the rule of names says that we have to conceal the names from other people. And it's part of how we live our life. There is a insider-outsider discrepancy or discordance, you could say. Now, names and naming play a very important role in a number of different places. I want to go back to that story, the, the rule of names, because um, there's a bit of a little bit of a twist. If you haven't read the story, there's going to be a bit of a spoiler here. So Mr. Underhill has somebody coming after him, somebody who thinks that Mr. Underhill may have stolen his treasure. And Mr. Underhill didn't steal the treasure directly, although as it turns out he has, because what happened was a dragon came down and killed all these people and stole a horde and then flew off with it. And then the, uh, the guy who tracks them down um, says, that must have been a, a you know, very powerful dragon, and I want that stuff back. His name is Blackbeard in this case. And what he finds when he tracks the dragon down are dragon bones. He says, wow. A wizard must have done this, killed the dragon, taken the horde. Now I'm going to find that wizard and I'm going to kill him and get my treasure back. So he says, that must have been a powerful wizard and a clever one. First to kill a dragon, second to get off without leaving a trace. The lords and mages of the archipelago couldn't track him at all. Neither where he'd come from nor he'd where he'd made off to. They were about to give off. That was last spring. I have been tracking it, and I have have found it. Those fools of the league couldn't find it. Why not? Because it's not theirs. It belongs to the House of Pendor. And the great emerald, the star of the horde, knows its master. Right. So we have a wizard who is tracking these things down. And then he says, um, here we go. The jewel knows its master, and I know the thief, and I shall conquer him. He's a mighty wizard who could overcome a dragon, but I am mightier. Do you know why? Because I know his name. Underhill says, how did you learn it? And Blackbeard grinned and did not answer. Black magic? How else? Uh, now, he's talking to Bert about this. And when he does find Underhill, as it turns out, he does have the right name. He does call the right name. However, there's a little twist, a little trick. Underhill is that dragon, and his name is Yevod. And the dragon consumes him. The dragon says, well, I'm, I'm done, you know, hiding or anything like that. Comes out of hiding and starts eating everybody. And it shows you that it's not enough just to get the name right. You have to also understand the thing as well. Now, in the... In the uh, series, 
I don't want to go too deep into this. In um, A Wizard of Earthsea, Gad does a very foolish thing, and he uses spells which rend the, the fabric of reality, the, the vision between life and death or light and darkness. And in doing so, he lets in something that becomes his monstrous double and not only tries to kill him and take him over and turn him into a, a being, they call it a gibbeth, a being of evil, which will wreak all sorts of havoc if it's allowed to. It also kills people that are close to him, even the little pet that he has, which, you know, stays around his neck. And so long as Ged is running away from it, this thing has power over him. There's an offer by um, the, the Lord and Lady of, um, where is this, of Terranon to use the Stone of Terranon, which represents one of the old powers, to reveal the name of this, this thing that Ged needs to fight and ultimately conquer. He tries by all sorts of means to find the name. He rejects that offer because he knows that, that there's some treachery involved. <clears throat> and what we find in the end is the only way that Ged is able to have power over this thing is by naming it. And the way that he names it is by giving it his own true name because it is from him. It is his double. And in doing so, he gains the power to overcome it and thereby to banish the evil that is taking place. As his friend Vetch is um, along with him on this, this final, you know, uh, uh, final battle. So <clears throat> he says, um, here we go. Until that moment, Vetch had watched him with an anxious dread. He was not sure what had happened in the dark land. He did not know if this was Ged in the boat with him, and his hand had been for hours ready to, to the anchor to stave in the boat's planking and sink her there in mid-sea rather than carry back to the harbors of Earthsea the evil thing he feared might have taken, Ged's look and form. When he saw his friend and heard him speak, his doubt vanished, and he began to see the truth that Ged had neither lost nor won, but naming the shadow of his death with his own name had made himself whole, a man who, knowing his whole true self, cannot be used or possessed by any power other than himself, and whose life is therefore lived for life's sake and never in the service of ruin or pain or hatred or the dark. So the name is incredibly important to one's not just power, but one's identity, one's reality. A little bit later in the tombs of Atuan, one of the things that we find so important for the female protagonist, who is, there's really two protagonists in this, Ged, who is attempting to steal a treasure from the, the uh, labyrinth of Atuan to make whole a, a ring and find a rune that will, will set things right again. And the, the woman who's known as Arha, the Eaten One, who is supposed to be a reincarnation of the previous priestess of the Nameless Ones. Notice, the Nameless Ones, right? And in this case, she is finally given back a name. And her name, her true name, is Tenar. So this represents her being individuated, her being no longer part of this long string of bodies that a, a priestess has happened to occupy. Um, so that is, is a particularly important thing. There's a discussion with uh, Ged. I'll come back to that in a moment. First, she, she has a uh, uh, dream. Uh, she dreams of the souls of the dead in the walls of the painted room and she goes on, these are the souls of those not reborn, the ancient peoples and unbelievers, those who the nameless ones devour. They squatted around her in the shadows, and a faint creaking or cheeping sound came from them now and then. One of them came up quite close to her. She was afraid at first and tried to draw away, but could not move. This one had the face of a bird, not a human face, but its hair was golden, and it said in a woman's voice, Tenar, tenderly, softly, Tenar. She wakes up. Really awake this time, she sat up, worn out by the night's dreaming. She tells herself, I am tenor, not aloud, and she shook with, shook with cold and terror and exultation there under the open sun-washed sky. I have my name back. I am tenor. This is a reassertion of her identity. 
when she's talking with, with Ged in the labyrinth as they're preparing to figure out what they're going to do, there is a discussion between them. And she says, um, here we go, talking about these, these, these beings. Do you truly think them dead? You know better in your, your heart. They do not die. They are dark and undying, and they hate the light, the brief bright light of our mortality. They are immortal, but they are not gods. They never were. They are not wor worth the worship of any human soul. What have they ever given you, Tinar? Nothing, she whispered. They have nothing to give. They have no power of making. All their power is to darken and destroy. They cannot leave this place. They are this place, and it should be left to them. They should not be denied or forgotten, but neither should they be worshipped. The earth is beautiful and bright and kindly, but that is not all. The earth is also terrible and dark and cruel. And so he goes on and he says, there are, there are places made in the world where darkness gathers, places given wholly over to the ones who we call nameless, the ancient and holy powers of the earth before the light, the powers of the dark, of ruin, of madness. The nameless ones are are. They say that the nameless ones are dead. Only a lost soul lost to truth could believe it. They exist, but they are not your masters. They never were. You are free, Tenor. You are taught to be a slave, but you have broken free. And she says to him, how is it that you know my name? He says, knowing names is my job, my art, to weave the magic of a thing you see one must find its true name out. In my land, we keep our true names hidden all our lives long from all but those whom we trust utterly, for there is great power and great peril in a name. Once at the beginning of time, when Segoi raised the isles of Earthsea from the ocean deeps, all things bore their own true names, and all doing of magic, all wizardry hangs upon the knowledge, the relearning, the remembering of that true and ancient language of the making. So, uh, this... Is, is another important point. Not only does everything have a name, there are also things that don't have names that we'll never discover the names for. They may indeed have names that are so hidden that we can't, we can't grasp them. He, he talks in another place, and I forget exactly which story it's in, about being able to control portions of the sea, but each part of the sea might have its own name, and the wizard or mage or, or whoever would have to spend time discovering that. The last one that I'll, I'll mention is in another early story. Um, the uh, Here we go. The Word of Unbinding. The protagonist in it, who prefigures Ged fighting with Cobb in the farthest shore, there is a, a wizard, Vol, whose magic is, is strong and who has been Vol the Fell, who's more wizard but less than man, who passed from island to island of the outer reach, undoing the works of the ancients, enslaving men, cutting forests, spoiling fields, sealing in underground tombs, any wizard or mage who tried to combat him. So the protagonist in this is a wizard, Festin, who is sealed in one of these underground tombs. And he decides, what I'm going to do is... Um, here we go. If I'm wrong, men will think I was a coward. Uh, turning his head a little to the side, he closed his eyes, took a last deep breath, and whispered the word of unbinding, which is only spoken once. This was not transformation. He was not changed. His body, the clever hands, the eyes he liked to look on trees and streams lay unchanged, only still, perfectly still and full of cold. But the walls were gone. He goes to a place of the dead. In life he had great power, so here he did not forget like a candle flame, he moved in the darkness of the wider land, and remembering, he called out his enemy's name, Vol, called, unable to withstand. Vol came towards him. Festin approached, and the other cowered and screamed as if burnt. Festin followed when he fled, followed him close. A long way they went over dry lava flows. There's a long description here. And they're in a land where nothing changes. The Vol shadow is forced to enter a dry stream bed. Vol cowered, stooped, and entered into the open mouth of his own dead body. At once the corpse vanished. Unmarked stained, the dry boulders gleamed in starlight. Festin stood for a while, then slowly sat down on the great rocks to rest. So by, again, using the name and by making a great sacrifice, he's able to put an end to a 
great evil. So that's probably enough about this particular theme, which is a very interesting one, is it not? A second very important theme of this Earthsea trilogy is a literary theme, but also a philosophical theme. And it is of learning and developing into your identity as a person. So we talk about coming of age novels and A Wizard of Earthsea really is a coming of age novel, isn't it? It's about this guy who starts out at seven years old, you know, on some, you know, rather distant kind of provincial island, um, finding out that he has some talent, you know, working with his aunt who gives him some things, eventually working with a mage on the island who's actually studied at, at Roke and then being sent to Roke to, um, learn further and become a genuine mage. There's some other things happening along the way, the repulsion of the Kargish invaders, right? All of these things are sort of standard elements, you know, in moving from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. But there's something else that happens along the way for Ged or Sparrowhawk, which is that he, he allows something in by wanting to take on too great power and doing so in response to foolish uh, provocations. In, in the one case by the, the girl uh, on, on the island, in the other case by this other student mage, Jasper, who he has a rivalry with. And in both cases, he tries to take on more power than he, he ought to. And so it's, it's in some respects a perennial problem, is it not, of the talented that when you start out and you really haven't learned that much, there's a tendency to think that you are more capable than you are. And especially if you haven't managed your emotions well, you can't tell when people are goading you into foolishness or um, you know, seducing you in certain ways. And so Ged ends up allowing something to come into this world of Earthsea that shouldn't be there, an element of darkness a being of evil, something parasitic, something bad, something non-life. And it winds up becoming the main antagonist of the entire Wizard of Earthsea. Once he lets this in at Roke and, you know, they have to undo the damage that's been done, he winds up, uh, you know, being grievously hurt and has to go uh, on, on a mission. He's, he's sort of sent away uh, after having some learning um, to assume his role as a mage. And it's sort of like being sent to the proverbial uh, Alaskan weather station in the army. They want to get you out of there. Now, it's not quite so malicious as that, but what we find that he ends up doing is in the process um, dealing with dragons. And it's very interesting. The, the place that he's sent to is being troubled by these dragons. And he's less afraid of these dragons than he is of this shadow that could destroy him and create so much trouble for everybody in the, in the world if it's able to possess him, because it will be possessing a mage and thereby using that power for evil. What happens in the story? We have a Ged who is at first fleeing from this, this evil being, unable to face it, unable to deal with it. And then eventually he finds out that if he does turn and face it, although it's going to be difficult, now it becomes a different sort of chase. He is running after it. And he literally chases it to the ends of the earth or the sea of the earth uh, in the end by bringing his friend Vetch along. And the way in which he's able to overcome it is by essentially embracing it and giving it his own name. It is his shadow, and once he can integrate that, he's able to overcome it and to leave it behind. Well, this is a coming-of-age story. It is a finding out who you are. And in the case of Ged, you could say what he finds out about himself is that he has a rare amount of talent, and he doesn't have, at the, at the time of his life, he doesn't have the emotional maturity or the, the you know, the... Uh, other kinds of maturity and learning to be able to handle it. And he messes things up terribly and then has to try to set them right. And a lot of people get hurt and damaged along the way. 
So he finishes the book a older and smarter young man than he began it. And then we get to the tombs of Atuan, which doesn't begin with Ged. It begins with Arya, uh, who the Eaton one, this girl who is supposed to be the reincarnation of the um, the god, or not the goddess, the 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 uh, um, priestess, right? Um, we begin with with this. Uh, her being taken, the child uh, who is identified as it. Here we go. Um, Let the nameless ones behold the girl given to them who is verily the one born ever nameless. Let them accept her life in the years of her life until her death, which is also theirs. Let them find her acceptable. Let her be eaten. Uh, And so she becomes this person who is important. Although the cult is less and less uh, looked to by the Kargish uh, kings who want to establish themselves as priests as well. And she is uh, in the midst of all of these trainings and rituals and, and things like that. And she finds out that the service of these nameless ones has certain benefits, but it also has certain costs. And so she is identified with this role. She doesn't know who she is. She's been taken from her family. It's through her interaction with Ged, who is there to steal a half of of a ring from the the temple. He has the other half um, that she is able to acquire a full understanding of who she is. She's, She's buying into this, my role is who I am. I am the eaten one. And then she discovers her true name and her identity and chooses, and this is where where it becomes very important, she has a choice that she has to make. Is she going to stay? Is she going to allow Ged to die? Is she going to kill him herself? She could do any of these things. Or is she going to escape away from Atawan and betray the very deities uh, the not quite gods, but rather powers of the earth who are in control of, of these, these tombs. And she chooses that. And in doing so, she is leaving behind so much of her old identity. And she is moving forward into assuming a new identity. Ged is a helper in that and a companion, but she is the one who has to make the choice. So this is also a coming-of-age story. Ged is older than her. She is essentially a teenager making this decision about where she's going to go and leaving her training, leaving her um, people, leaving her land behind, leaving the, the, the nameless ones behind for the wider, uh, the wider archipelago of Earthsea. In the third book, we have yet another character, um, Aaron, a young man who is Prince of Enlad, and he comes bearing some information to to Roke. Um, the Archmage Ged is there, Sparrowhawk, of course, right? We don't want to always reveal his true name. And uh, there have been all these reports that magic is no longer working as it should be. And it's causing all sorts of other problems throughout these, these lands. The further out that you get, the more it seems like magic is dripping or being drained out of the world. And along with it, people's competence and the ways of, of living that people have. So Aaron is there and he's at the beginning, he's very starstruck, we could say, right? I think it would be good to, to look at the uh, description that is given at the start. This is a, a case of um, a young man who has heard so much about um, this, this great wizard, right? So he comes in and um, gives his, his report. There we go. Need to get a little bit further into it. Um, ah, you are the son of the Prince of Enland and the Enlidus, the Archmage said, heir of the Principality of Morad. 
There's no older heritage in all Earthsea, none fairer. I've seen the orchards of Enlad in the spring and the golden roofs of, Bar of Barilla. How are you called? I am called Arin. That would be a word in the dialect of your land. What is it in our common speech? The boy said, sword. The archmage nodded. There was silence again, and the boy said, not boldly, but without timidity, I had thought the archmage knew all languages. The man shook his head, watching the fountain. And all names? All names. Only Segoy, who spoke the first word, raising up the isles from the deep sea, knew all names. To be sure, if I needed to know your true name, I would know it, but there's no need. Aaron, I will call you, and I am Sparrowhawk. Then he talks with him for a while. And what, what we see is a boy who is um, very taken by uh, Sparrowhawk and, you know, sort of thinks like, this is my hero, you know. I don't have any magical talent. My dad does. I wish I did because then I could study here with this guy. And that's where he begins. And then they go through all of these adventures, really engaging in something almost like a detective story for a while. And at, at one point, uh, Aaron saves uh, Ged's life by the, the actions that he takes. And they even wind up in a place where Aaron begins to doubt Ged and think that maybe he isn't quite so great as as he's been cracked up to be. Um, and this is like learning about the, this is the, the young person who's learning about that heroes are human and arising to a certain level of heroism theirself. Ged could not have won against Cobb solely by his own powers. He needs Aaron to get him through it. And by the end, Aaron has, again, matured into a person. He knows who he is by having left some things behind and by having gained some other things. Now, all of this pertains to identity, the identity of these, these characters. We could also talk about the identity of other beings that remains more or less the same. You know, the ancient uh, mage Ogun in, in uh, Gaunt, you know, remains about the same. Um, the dragons, of course, they don't mature other than growing bigger and bigger and bigger. They already are born knowing the, the true speech and knowing who they are. Um, so the identity of, of those creatures is something quite different than humans. We go through a developmental process, and that is what I would say the first three books are in significant part about. We have three main characters. Uh, Ged is a main character through all of it, but then we also have these other two as well. A third important theme, of course, in these works is how magic works. And is this a philosophical theme? I think we can say that it is because it's, there's a metaphysics involved here. We've already talked about the, the role that naming plays, but we can also talk about the fact that there's all different ways in which magic plays out. We have magical beings like the dragons, of course, and then we have human beings who have some sort of talent or capacity more than others. And they're not all wizards. They're not all witches. As a matter of fact, some of them are craftspeople like the dyers whose magic uh, goes away from them, leaving them bereft and unable to really make the wonderful, beautiful uh, cloths that they were making before using magic. So magic is an integral part of the existence of human beings. It's expected that, that on each island there will be at least one wizard, however you know bad at their craft, who can at least like patch boats together and heal people. There are a lot of women who are also practicing magic. One of the things that, that Le Guin uh, you know, thought about later and took a bit of heat from, from feminists was that magic was primarily in its higher form a male thing, whereas women were, were not practicing it uh, at such a high degree in a, you know the the Earthsea trilogy, although of course who recognizes uh, Sparrowhawk or Ged's uh, talent? It's his aunt, right? Who is a uh, magic working woman on the Isle of of Gaunt, and 
magic can come in a number of different forms. Um, at, at the, the Isle of Roque, they have these masters who teach the different forms, each of which has a different way of, of arranging things and getting the students to do things. There are also spells written down that one can find and then use and recite, sometimes with bad effects, like what, what Ged does as he uh, lets this evil being in. And you can also say that there, you know, the magic of things is in a certain way an integration with the rest of the world. So the way things work organically, magic taps into that. And this is where we get to some other really important, not just metaphysical, but we could say ethical ideas as well. And this is where Le Guin's interest in not just, but I would say primarily Taoism, plays a big role as well. So there's this talk of an equilibrium about things needing to be balanced out. This is part of why um, Ged does not just use magic all the time to do whatever he wants, for example, to move his boat or things like that. He saves his power. And there's this idea that you shouldn't be using it without <clears throat> exercising some forethought, without you know, making sure that the things that you're doing fit. So magic, there's a temptation to use magic just to control, to display power, to say crush enemies or to do the things that you want, make a buck. But that would be upsetting the, the equilibrium. That's not the best way to use magic. And here we could actually bring in, uh, although it's not completely connected with this, a Taoist concept of non-action, Wu Wei, of, of doing, in some respect, as little as possible, but doing the right thing at the right time to steer things in the right direction. What we can say about the first and the third book is that there is a vast imbalance taking place in both of them. In the one case, it's happening through Ged, and it affects him and those close to him, and it also threatens the rest of the world because we, there's this, this being that's allowed in, a, a non-being, a anti-life, a darkness, a shadow, right? And if it possesses him, it will turn him into a gibbeth, which then will have all the powers that he has and go and wreak havoc and peril on the land. There's also in the um, early story, um, the, uh, n the, the word of unbinding, right? This character who uh, is called Vol, Vol uh, the Fell, who is, is doing all of these horrible things across Earthsea. That would be another example of somebody who's using magic and doing so in, in a, a wicked and damaging way, right? Upsetting, again, the equilibrium, which has to be set right by this guy, Festin. Then in the third one, in, in, the, in the novel involving Ged and involving um, Aaron, what we have is a former uh, classmate uh, of Ged who he knows, Cobb, who is upsetting things on a much greater level to the, to the degree that Cobb is able to try to make himself into something like a, uh, you know, a warlock and a king all in one, something almost like a god. And he's also leeching all the magic out of Earthsea and turning even the dragons into mere beasts, unable to speak, unable to know themselves just reacting on an animal level. This is a very important uh, transformation and concept there. There's always this possibility, we could say in the tombs of Atawan and also in uh, Wizard of Earthsea, there are these old powers that are not human and not dragon and, and, not, and not really helpful for us, maybe worshipped or manipulated by people. This stone that, that's found in one place, the nameless ones in the tombs of Atawan, in the labyrinth and all of, all of that area. And they are, you can call them evil if you want to, but they don't, they don't go beyond where they currently are. Although the, the uh, manipulators of, of the stone 
um, want to the stone of, of Taran want to use Ged in order to expand their their range. In the case of Cobb, there is an attempt to, in in some respect, devour or take over the world, to turn everything into what it is that that he wants. And if we think about the reason behind this, one of the things that comes very clear in um, the farthest shore. The farthest shore is the entrance into the land of the dead, where nothing changes and the dead exist and you can cross over and then you probably can't cross back. So Cobb has died, but he's come back from that. And in doing so, he's disrupted things across the entire world. That has to be set right. That has to be fixed in some way. And that is exactly what, what Ged and Aaron are doing in the story at great cost to themselves and at great cost to the dragon uh, who has to, well, dragons, actually, who sacrifice themselves. So this is a, a really important idea that magic isn't just something fun to play around with or, you know, uh, this epic struggle between white magic and black magic or anything like that. It's a much more complex conception that Le Guin has, and it can be used well when it's integrated with the rest of the, what, what, let's call it a system, and it can be used badly when, particularly with human beings, they use it for <clears throat> ends that we don't, we can't even just call it selfish ends, but let's call them self-aggrandizing ends or, or self-prioritizing uh, ends. In this case, in the case of Cobb, to avoid dealing with death and this, this drive for that things do have to remain in their existence can be deleterious for the rest of the creation. And that's, that's where magic is really um, coming in and working in this, this, this set of stories. We've talked about three important philosophical themes found in the Earthsea trilogy contained in the books of Earthsea, this, this wonderful omnibus edition. And next month, we're going to be continuing to talk about some of these themes and introducing new ones as we go on to read the other Earthsea books and discuss them. We can also talk about more themes for those who want to join me after the premiere of this video in the video conferencing session. But I'm going to leave you with two other micro themes, we'll call them, that are uh, both discussed here in the farthest shore within the space of two pages. So in the first one, it has to do with action and identity. And there is a really wonderful discussion here. And this is how, you know, Ursula K. Le Guin has a, a very philosophical approach to things, I would say, like, you know, other authors that are great thinkers like Philip K. Dick, Dostoevsky, uh, this, is, this is really quite wonderful. So she says, uh, or she, she has um, Sparrowhawk say this. Um, I've been pretending that I am free, that there's nothing wrong in the world, that I'm not archmage, not even sorcerer, that I'm Hawk of Tamir, without responsibilities or privileges, owing nothing to anyone. He stopped and after a while went on. And he's talking to Aaron. Try to choose carefully, Aaron, when the great choices must be made. When I was young, I had to choose between the life of being and the life of doing, and I leapt at the ladder like a trout to a fly. But each deed you do, each act, binds you to itself and to its consequences and makes you act again and yet again. Then very seldom do you come upon a space, a time like this, between act and act, when you may stop and simply be, or wonder who, after all, you are. <clears throat> How could such a man, thought Aaron, be in doubt as to who and what he was? He had believed such doubts were reserved for the young who had not yet done anything. The boat rocked in the great cool darkness. That's why I like the sea, said Sparrowhawk's voice in the darkness. Aaron understood him, but his own thoughts ran ahead, as they'd been doing all these three days and nights to their quest, the aim of their sailing. And since his companion was in a mood to talk, he asked, Do you think we will find what we seek in Horttown? 
and it goes on from there. But this, this great lesson about when we act, when we decide, we bind ourselves to those actions and they compel us to act and act and act. But there arrive places and times where we can, we can pause for a bit and we can then think about, am I doing the right thing? Am I reacting in ways that are bad or foolish? Am I listening to the right voices? And the, the notion of the sea providing an, uh, an opportunity to get things right, you might say, by using what Rainer Maria Rilke calls solitude is a, a prime example of this. The uh, second one that I want to leave you with um, is a discussion about dragons. Sparrowhawk says, The dragons are avaricious, insatiable, treacherous, without pity, without remorse. But are they evil? Who am I to judge the acts of dragons? They are wiser than men are. It is with them as with dreams, Aaron. We men dream dreams. We work magic. We do good. We do evil. The dragons do not dream. They are dreams. They do not work magic. It is their substance, their being. They do not. They do not do. They are. So this is quite an interesting idea, is it not, of beings who their full nature would be there in pure actuality. Uh, dragons, he says, just to reiterate this, um, the dragons do not dream, they are dreams. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? So on that, we'll close out. For those who've been uh, watching this in the premiere, you're welcome to join us afterwards for some video conferencing and further discussion of this. Those who uh, are watching this after the premiere, we will be doing uh, another uh, uh, attack or delving into Earthsea next month. And you can certainly leave whatever you want to say in the comments and continue the discussion that way. This is, uh, again, the end of session 46 of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction. Glad you could join me for this.